uh, if this will start typing. In terms of data encoding, okay, that's what we've been talking about for a while now. Um, what kind of data have we encoded? What have we done? Numbers, okay. So far, we've encoded numbers. And we did this a couple of different types, okay. We did unsigned integers. We did signed integers, and we've done floating point. Okay, but everything that we've encoded so far has been numerical information um, that we would do arithmetic with or something along those lines. Okay, so now what? Let's talk about how we would encode text. Okay, so... Uh, in one sense, right, it's just going to be, again, a bunch of binary stuff, right? That's really the only thing we have to work with. And so what we have to do is sort of figure out or decide on some sort of standard for what bit pattern corresponds to what letter or symbol or something along those lines, okay? And the first stab at this, historically was uh, using a standard called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. -I. And it's like American stand something, 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 something. I don't remember what it stands for. We can go look it up. Okay, but ASCII. Okay, and this was originally a 7-bit standard. Later expanded to an 8-bit standard. Okay, how many things can we, how many different patterns are there if we use 7 bits? So how many different things could we encode with 7 bits? Well, for, what's the formula that we need to use to compute it? 2 to the Seven, right? Because we got seven bits. All right, what is that? Yeah, 128. Okay, pretty good. All right, and then with eight bits, of course, we can do 256. Okay. And eight bits is kind of a nice, um, I mean, eight is the power of two, and it's sort of a, uh, a good basic chunk for this. Okay. So with this standard, we could encode either 128 or 256 things. And the original ASCII, so let me actually uh, pull up here. Oops, I want to go to this and then. You can find these out, you know, all over the place. Okay, these tables. Okay, and so here's basically all, well, let me get those stupid cookies out of here, all 256 of them, okay? So the, the way this was started, right, is a 128-bit scheme. It was preserved, and then we added another 128 on top, which is called extended ASCII. Uh, although I think nowadays, and probably for the last 30, 40 years, everybody has just referred to ASCII as the whole 256 uh, pattern. Okay, now, a lot of these symbols, okay, are not really things that you would print. They're not symbols like that are used in writing, okay? So the first, you know, significant chunk of these things are used for uh, basic encoding of things like communications protocols. Okay, so for example, there's a uh, end of transmission uh, acknowledgement, you know, kind of those sorts of things uh, that are built in here. There's also a couple of things in here that are kind of, um, how to put it, they're a little obsolete nowadays, right? So a carriage return, 
What is a carriage return? You guys know? Has anybody ever used a typewriter? Not even when you were kids and you just bang on one just for fun to keep yourself entertained? The thing back, exactly. That's a carriage return, right? So on a typewriter, when you get to the end of the line, you have to move the whole contraption, the carriage, back over to the left, and then the, uh, the paper, uh, you have to advance vertically by one row, one line, if you will. Okay, so back in the day, um, the printers for these, for, for computers, actually looked more like automated typewriters. Okay, they were called teletype. And so it was like a typewriter in the sense that it would go across the paper and ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, print uh, different characters and then carriage return and advance the paper to the next line. Um, fortunately, we've, we've kind of moved on beyond that. Uh, so yeah, so like I said, there's a lot of stuff in here that these aren't printable characters. Um, but then the printable ones start here. Okay, um, and the um, this particular table is kind of nice because it gives you uh, the description, but also it shows you what the symbol is. Okay, now space. Obviously, you 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 can't print a space, and you don't recognize that a space is there unless you have something on either side of it to see that there's that that uh, white space. Um, okay, so we've got space, exclamation mark, quotation marks, all the different, you know, dollar signs, those sorts of things. And then uh, we get all the digits down here and some more punctuation and some mathematical symbols. Okay, and then finally, the text part starts here. Okay, and uh, 256 may seem like a whole lot of things or 128 even. Okay, but let's just think about the English alphabet. How many things do we need to encode just the English alphabet? Okay, 26, but really 52, because we've used both lower and upper case, okay? Uh, 62 if you inc include all the digits, okay? And then you start throwing on all the punctuation symbols and stuff, okay? And we're, and we're getting pretty close to 128, in short order, okay, so, um, all right, so we've got all the uppercase characters, okay, then some more accenting, and then all the lowercase characters, and then a bit more on the um, uh, punctuation and stuff, okay, uh, and then, so, so that's the original ASCII, the seven-bit scheme, and you'll notice with all of these, their, their far left bit is a zero, and that's how you can kind of tell immediately if it's a part of regular, the original ASCII or the extended part. Okay, so that's a whole lot of symbols. What more could you want? Right? Well, remember the A in ASCII is American, right? So this, this encoding standard is very Merca uh, in the sense that well, there are plenty of other languages in the world, and they deserve to be able to have their stuff encoded too, right? Okay. In particular, um, let's take sort of Western European languages like Spanish or French. Okay. Can you do French with just the English alphabet or Spanish with just the English alphabet? Almost. Okay. But what's the problem you run into? Yeah, accents and with Spanish, yeah, there's the, the N with the, the little tilde above it, right? In French, there's the C with the, the little dangly bit. Uh, so, and then of course, all the accenting. So these quickly got added to the extended set, okay? And with the printing stuff starting kind of here, uh, so we've got the uppercase the A with the, the various accents that you could put on it, uh, the AE, the C with the cedilla, the E with all of its various accents. Okay, so it's uh, 
<clears throat> mostly the vowels, of course, that get accented. Um, and then uh, we've got, uh, this, this one's fun, uh, capital letter, letter thorn. How many of you guys are, are really up on your old English? This used to be an English letter back in the day. Okay, uh, and then all the lowercase ones, right? So this thing, this it looks like a beta, but it's really used in German as like a double S. Um, what, what's it called? S said, okay, uh, which is, it says right there, S said, right? Uh, okay, uh, then we've got, you know, all the lowercase letters uh, or with their accenting, okay? But then, huh? Diaresis. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't mean what you think. Um, so di diaresis, uh, it means that that letter is to be pronounced as a separate syllable. So you're, you're supposed to break the, um, break pronunciation to start a new syllable there um, and not combine it with a, a previous letter. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so like, I, I guess a good example would be, uh, sometimes you'll see the word coordinate written that way, coordinate, and so sometimes you'll see a diaresis on the second O to indicate that it's not coordinate, it's coordinate, right? So you're, you're breaking the, the syllable there um, for, for pronunciation's sake. Now, I think nobody writes coordinate that way, and you guys just know as, well, most of you are native speakers, right? That that's just how you say it. And um, now this of course presents all kinds of fun for our uh, English learners where they're learning English as a second language because doesn't this mean that learning English is really confusing because there's all these silly rules uh, that nobody bothers to write down or tell you. Okay, so. Uh, so there's some extended set, and, and this is all great, right? I mean, we've got all these Western European languages. What possibly more could we want? Yeah. Yeah, non-romance languages. An example? What would be an example of a non-romance language? Russian. Okay. Doc Comrade. Uh, so, yeah, Russian, Greek, uh, they're relatively, the orthography is somewhat similar, um, but not completely. Okay, so there's not even Greek letters in here, um, much less something like Chinese, okay, or uh, Arabic, or Hebrew, or, right, so there's a whole lot of languages that have been left out of the boat here. Okay, so what do we do? Well, what do we, what's the only option? We've run out of, we've hit our 256 things. So now what? More bits, right? Okay, and <clears throat> then we have to change the scheme a little bit. Okay, and this extended, extended, extended scheme is called Unicode. Okay, so let's take a look at Unicode. Um, okay, so um, in addition to all the languages that are still in use, it would also be handy to encode languages that are no longer in use. So, for example, hieroglyphics, right? Or cuneiform. I mean, how often do you need to type that? I don't know. But if you're like an archaeologist who studies uh, hieroglyphics, would it be handy to be able to sort of type hieroglyphics and not have to just sit there and chisel away at a piece of paper, right? Okay, yeah. Um, so the, uh, this little, uh, you know, the, the website, right, 
it has here sort of a, an example set of a whole bunch of different characters, okay? And some of these we recognize, right? The Greek letters mu and zeta here. Uh, this is a Japanese character, okay? Then we've got some of this, like, emoji business going on. Uh, this is something from Arabic, um, right? And then some more ridiculous emojis, uh, some more Greek letters. Okay, but you get the idea. There's room for basically everything, okay? So let's look at here the code tables, if I can find where the uh, basic info. No, nope, that's not what I want. Just show me the code tables already, guys. Code charts, here we go. Okay, and so here's basically everything that's part of Unicode organized by what it is, okay? Uh, and so, for example, since Russian, we've got the Cyrillic, so we can look at the Cyrillic code table, okay? And let me blow this up a little bit. Okay, so each one of these things has its own encoding, okay, so its own number that's assigned to it, and these are written in hexadecimal, okay, so let's think about this, let's just take this, this letter, for example, okay, its encoding is 042B, so how many bits is that? 16, okay, and now other encodings in Unicode actually use more than that, because how many things can you encode with 16 bits? Well, we need to do 2 to the 16th, right? So what is that? 65,536. No, I did not just compute that in my head. I had that memorized, <laughs> okay? Um, okay, so that's a lot, right? No, 34. 36, 34. Well, whatever. Okay, that's a lot. 65,000 different things. Okay, but if we start throwing Russian and Chinese, I mean, how many characters are there in Chinese? Is anybody studying Chinese? I mean, there are thousands of them, right? And that's just Chinese. Okay, then you start throwing in, you know, like, well, Korean is more of an alphabet system, but that's just for Chinese, right? We could easily run out of a 16-bit uh, standard here. Okay, so here's a bunch of Cyrillic ones. Okay, that's great. Uh, then we've got Greek, for example, language that's near and dear to my heart. Okay, and uh, actually you guys will, will notice um, ancient Greek actually had some letters that have fallen out of use over the time. So for example, uh, this letter here, not part of uh, any fraternity that I know of. Um, this is uh, called Sampi. Um, or let's see, where's a digamma? Looks kind of like an F. Here it is. So in, um, <clears throat> in old, old, old ancient Greek, this letter that looks like an F uh, was present. It was called the digamma because it looks like two gammas that are sort of stacked on top of each other. And it made the sound wa. Okay. Um, now here's how we know it dropped out of Greek. Um, what is the name? Uh, well, or, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll use this example. What is the name for the city that the Greeks went to fight against uh, because Helen basically got you know, uh, eloped with, uh, with a dude. Troy, okay. What's the Greek name for that city? It's not Troy. Hmm? Well, what's the name of the book? The yeah, the Iliad. Okay, so it's Ilion. Okay, but what was the name for that city in the language of the people who lived there? Wilusa. Okay, so Wilusa became Ilion. The W dropped out. Okay, another example. 
what's the word for wine in Latin? We still use this in English. It's vino, okay, but we know, right? What is the word for wine in Greek? Oinos. Where's the w? So dropped out. Okay. So anyway, uh, if you're studying old, old, old Greek, uh, then you need that letter. Okay. So then there's a whole bunch of these these things that are all accented funny because in ancient Greek the accenting is much more exotic than in modern Greek. Um, just to keep things interesting. Okay. Uh, some of these other symbols in here don't look like Greek. They're what's called Coptic. So there's a few things that kind of got combined. Um, Coptic is um, uh, a language and writing system that was uh, used uh, still to some extent um, in Egypt. Uh, basically, it's uh, like Egyptian, but with using sort of Greek-like characters to alphabetize it rather than using hieroglyphic -y kind of symbols. Um, uh, it's still still used uh, to this day. Um, so, okay. All right, so we've got that. Ancient Greek numbers, this one's kind of fun. Um, so the Greeks had a couple of different number systems, uh, one of which worked eh, more or less like Roman numerals did. Uh, and it looks a little ridiculous uh, if you don't know the system, but, you know, here it is, okay? Um, all right, so we've mentioned, uh, well, let's find some Chinese stuff, right? Well, okay, so this is going to be on the East Asian script side, and most of these CJK, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, are combined. Okay, this one's big. Right, because there's lots and lots of these characters. Um, now, in ja the Japanese writing system, uses the Chinese symbols along with two extra little sets of things that are uh, uh, um, syllabaries. So they only add, you know, another fifty something each. Um, but yeah, here they all are, and notice how they're kind of organized. Okay, is anybody actually taking Chinese here? Anybody? No? Okay, so um, the stroke patterns are a big deal, right? And when you write, you're, you're sort of taught not just what symbol to make, but what order to put the strokes in as you make it. And so notice that a lot of these are sorted uh, by kind of stroke family. Um, and there's a lot of blanks. Okay, where, that are not used for any particular symbol, uh, and those are thrown in there um, mostly just to keep everything spaced nicely. Okay, but I mean we could scroll through this for hours, right? Because there are, you know, 500 pages in this document, um, and that's just the Chinese stuff, right? Well, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Okay, so. This is a pretty pretty massive pile of, of stuff, okay? Um, okay, so good. Um, let's look at some other ones that are maybe a little bit more interesting in the sort of archaic sense, okay? Um, how about linear B syllabary? This is very old, right, and definitely no longer used. Right? How many of you guys have, you know, had to dust up your old linear B syllabary? No? If you were Indiana Jones, this might be really handy. Of course, Indiana Jones didn't really have a computer, right? Because, you know, if you're busy fighting Nazis, there's no computers. Um, all right, so let's see what else do we have in here that's kind of of, of interest. Okay, so... Uh, they're sort of sorted geographically, right? African scripts, South Asian, East Asian, Middle Eastern, um, Central Asian, numbers, digits, mathematical symbols, geometric shapes, alchemical symbols. So this is kind of fun, right? I mean, given that we're in a science building, right? Uh, some of these things, like sulfur and mercury and you know 
all the stuff that you would do if you were doing arcane, medieval, pseudoscience. No? Um, uh, symbols for games, chess and checkers symbols, uh, cards, playing cards, that sort of stuff. Okay, and then somewhere in here is emoji, right? Emoticons. All right. Now, let's look at that because this kind of raises an interesting point here. Uh, how many, so let's take that, that smiley face at the top left. Okay, how many bits does it take to encode that number? 20, right? Because it's five um, hex characters, and each hex character is four bits. So Unicode is actually kind of interesting in the sense that it doesn't use the same number of bits for every character. And you look at the, the, the front of it to, to figure out, okay, how many bits does this particular character have? And there's a scheme for that kind of indicates that. Um, makes it a little bit annoying, but it also means that um, we're not using, uh, like there's not a whole lot of letters that have just a crap ton of zeros in front, right? So it's, it's efficient in that sense. Um, and the other thing is that ASCII is still part of Unicode, right? So this is sort of a backwards compatible standard in the sense that all the regular Latin letters and stuff that we looked at with the ASCII table are valid Unicode. Okay, so now, when I was learning this stuff, right, emojis didn't exist, right? We had some symbols like, you know, arrows and, uh, you know, things like that, but there weren't just a gajillion smiley faces, for example. Okay, now, these have become, I'm sure, uh, really important in y'all's world, right, okay? And this is just some of the smiley faces, right? Um, and then, you know, what's some of the other ones, like miscellaneous symbols? Okay. So, yeah, some of these make sense, like recycle symbols and uh, things that, you know, traffic signs and stuff like that. But there's all these, you know, ridiculous symbols in... Uh, like, my favorite sort of uh, ridiculous one uh, is, uh, well, the, uh, the poop emoji, okay? So there's a, a code point, right, a number. If we found the right table, it'd be on there to encode a poop emoji. Do we really, really need that? I mean, what do you guys think, right? Do we need to encode the poop emoji? Eh, I don't know. It's a matter of argument. But how many of you guys have used the poop emoji in the last week? <laughs> yeah, as one does. Uh, and actually, how many of you guys have seen my dear friend Noah walking around campus with his poop emoji hat? Yeah. He, he's in one of my other classes, and that's punishment for um, being a, owing me a few assignments, shall we say. So, um, yeah, so it is a little ridiculous that we've got stuff like the poop emoji or whatever, but that's okay, right? People use it in communication, right? Okay, maybe you haven't used the poop emoji in the last week, but how many, like... Just open, get it, get out your phones and pull open the text message app. Okay. And just in the first, you know, five or 10 messages, right? How many emoji are there that you've used? And, and which ones are they? Although after that party at Fiji on Saturday night, I don't know if I want to know some of the emojis that you guys were using.
No? So what kind of emojis are we finding? Okay, how many of you guys have the like, the smiley face that's crying? Yeah, or laughing so hard you're crying? Well, better late than never. Uh huh. Um, which, what symbols? Uh, other than the poop emoji. Huh? What 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 symbols? What emoji have you been used used in the last week? Okay. Huh? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, the thinking one. Okay. Yeah. The like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any others? No, but there's just a gajillion of these things, right? And people use them as a way to communicate. We've been talking about emoji all morning, right? It's, it's been great, right? Uh, we're not doing anything serious today. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, there's all these crazy emoji in there uh, to, along with, you know, all the various letters uh, and symbols from different languages. But you know what's not in Unicode? And this really, really gets my goat. Klingon is not in Unicode. Huh? Yeah, it's outrageous. In fact, well, that already happened once. So in the 90s, the Klingon Language Institute, okay, and yes, there is such a thing, okay, huh? Yes. Yeah, the Klingon Language Institute petitioned the Unicode Consortium to add Klingon. Okay, now Klingon is an alphabet, so there's only, you know, with the digits and stuff, you need, you know, 40, 50 different symbols, something like that, right? You wouldn't need thousands like you would for Chinese, and they denied it. But now we can have freaking poop emoji, right? So this just seems like a monumental injustice. And if there's anybody from the Unicode Consortium watching this stream, yeah. So I don't know, maybe we do need a change.org petition or, or something along those lines, right? Because uh, it just seems like, you know, uh, but it, of course in the early 90s, there was no poop emoji either. So um, yeah. Now on the subject of, of these symbols, okay, um, I, I wanna characterize, there's a difference between having a number to represent that symbol and then actually how that thing looks. Okay, so a good example of this would be, um, let's take the gun emoji. Okay, how many of you guys have Android devices? What does the gun emoji look like on yours? Uh, now it looks like a water gun, okay, but what did it used to look like? A real gun, okay. And then Apple, same thing, they changed it from a real gun to like a little squirt gun. Okay, so... But even though it's the same Unicode character, okay, so the character, like the number that's attached to it is not the same thing as the way it actually looks on the screen, okay? That's a whole other separate problem. Uh, another good example of this, it's maybe less, uh, less kind of ridiculous, would be the hamburger emoji. Okay, this caused major controversy uh, because the Apple hamburger emoji, uh, the way it looked, what did they do? Where was the cheese? It was underneath the patty. It went bread, cheese, patty, and then lettuce and tomato, and then the other bun. This is outrageous. How many of you put the cheese underneath the patty? Get out. <laughs> okay. This is just intolerable. Okay. Um, so anyway, yeah. It's, and then they changed it and actually kind of made a big deal. And they're like, yeah, we're sorry. We're stupid. We put the cheese where it belongs. Um, oh, it did? Okay. Maybe I've got this backwards. But so anyway, right. The cheese underneath the patty is just, just not to be done. Um, okay, so, but the point, though, there is that the way the thing is displayed on the screen, 
like the graphics information and stuff like that, that is not part of Unicode. Unicode is just about assigning a number to each symbol so that you know you can keep them all straight, okay? Now, if you want to talk about the way it looks, then you're talking about things like fonts, okay? And this is this actually gets a little bit annoying because, for example, some of these um, those weird old ancient Greek symbols, I actually use those on a maybe not daily basis, but as part of my, my professional job, my work, research, like I need to be able to use some of these old Greek characters that aren't necessarily part of uh, modern Greek. And the, if I'm using, for example, Times New Roman uh, when I'm writing something, which is usually what I use because uh, I think it looks good both in Latin and Greek, and I don't want to be switching fonts all the time in the middle of a document and have like Greek in one font and Latin and English stuff in another. Okay, so Times or Times New Roman, I think looks good in both of them. Okay, so great, everything's in Times. But the problem is that the particular Times New Roman font package or whatever that I have on my computer, you know, the one that just comes with every computer, doesn't have symbols for some of these old archaic Greek things. Okay, and so then if I need some of those old archaic Greek things, I have to put that symbol in its own font in order to have it, and it just looks stupid. And yeah, I mean, this is definitely a first world problem, but um, say la vie. Um, okay, so so that's just kind of a quick uh, quick thing here with Unicode. And let me go back to the ASCII table, um, or actually, let me show you uh, the one I put on Canvas. Okay, and uh, I forgot to bring these, but uh, I designed, uh, you know, kind of copied and pasted from one of these other charts. Um, and then fit it all on one page so that I can print it out and you guys can use it as like a reference sheet, okay? Uh, and here, I only did the printable ones because, um, you know, there's no need to, to look at all the non-printing ones. Okay, but I wanted to point out one thing that uh, is kind of handy. Um, well, first off, wouldn't it make sense to put the uppercase letters and the lowercase letters in the same order? Right? Wouldn't it be kind of silly to, like, just randomly switch up the order for one of them? Okay, that's nice. Uh, so what I want you to do is look at capital A and look at lowercase a and tell me what you notice. Hmm? Uh, yeah, and that's just because of the way I formatted it um, to, to fit it on the page nicely. So, so don't worry about that. Okay, but look at the, the numbers or the, the binary or the uh, either the decimal or hex. To, so the DEC here is decimal and then the other one's hex. What's the, the hex for the uh, uppercase A? 4-1. Mm -hmm. What about for the lowercase A? Ah, that's interesting. So what does that mean? Or what about with the decimal? It's uh, six five to nine seven. So what's the difference there? Thirty two in decimal or two zero in hex. Okay. So Owen, why is this useful? Huh? Yeah. Like, what, when, when have you used this, this fact that the uppercase and the lowercase are off by 32 decimal or 20 hex? Yeah, so Owen happens to be in uh, my other class, my other CS class, and one of the assignments that they had was to write a program that would take a string of text and convert anything that was lowercase to uppercase or the other direction, okay? Either way, right? But what was the secret sauce for that is knowing that in ASCII, to go from upper to lowercase, you add a constant number. And if you wanna go from lower to uppercase, you do the opposite, okay? So 
that's kind of handy um, that um, uh, that you can just sort of do that, right? So it's still the, somebody was smart here uh, when they when they oriented all this. Uh, okay, so great. Now um, with the binary stuff, I put a space in the middle there just for the sake of readability. Okay, but the space isn't really there. Um, so um, when you guys are doing one of the assignments with these, you know, what I would suggest is put it in with the spaces just to get it all correct and then take all the spaces out. Uh, and uh, that, that will make your life maybe slightly easier. Um, okay, so there we go. Um, all right, so we've talked about text now uh, with ASCII, and ASCII is still used uh, in a lot of stuff, okay? In particular, uh, like, like I said, Owen is in this other class of mine, and everything is in ASCII there, okay? In fact, it would be a big pain in the butt to try and uh, throw in Unicode, okay? Um, and uh, so, I mean, I can actually give you guys just a quick example of that. Um, well, so let's look at, um, Uh, all right, so don't worry about the details of what I'm doing here. Oops. Where is it? Well, it's in here somewhere. Um, so uh, what I wanted to, to just kind of show you is um, the, uh, well, here, let me show you the source code for the program. Uh, I don't know why it opened in that. So this thing here, hello world, okay, is encoded in ASCII. Okay, so if we were to look in memory, and that's what I was trying to do, but I'm not looking in the right spot, uh, then we could find uh, and see the H, the E, the L, and so on, and uh, we would read them off from our table and be like, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, I probably should have done one of the C examples instead of uh, the assembly one, but whatever. Okay. So, uh, so point being, uh, this this ASCII stuff is still very very much used uh, in programming, especially. Okay, and if you want to be doing stuff in Unicode, right? This causes you you have to do extra work in the programming department to do that. Well, okay, that depends on the language. So, how many of you guys has anybody done any Java um, at all? Okay, didn't figure so, but. Uh, I mean, other than Owen, right? Uh, so Java actually stores everything in Unicode, okay, which is handy, uh, but causes some bloat. Yeah, well, you said the same thing about C. Yeah. So what languages do you like? So Owen thinks both Java and, uh, huh? You like Python? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay. So, uh, so yeah, ASCII still is important. Um, great. So we've talked about text, right? So we did ASCII, then Unicode. And I'm, of course, misspelling hiero. Okay. 
So we get hieroglyphics and Russian and Chinese and poop emojis and hamburgers and every other symbol you could possibly think of. Okay, so that gets us text. Well, what other kinds of data might we want to encode? Bro face. Well, how about sound, music, video? What else? Okay. Yeah, colors. Right? So all of these things also have to have their own encoding schemes. Okay? And this is where it starts to get super complicated, as you could imagine. Okay? Because video, for example, um, how, well, what's one way to encode video is to say, all right, well, let me first worry about encoding a single picture. Okay? And how would I do that? Well, I'd probably have to have something that says, okay, how many pixels wide is it? How many pixels tall is it? And then decide how many bits am I going to use per pixel to encode how much red is there, how much green is there, how much blue is there, and so on. Okay. Um, okay, that's great. So let's say you figure it out for a picture. It takes up a lot of data. Okay, now you want to watch a movie. Okay. Uh, so actually this gets back to one of the, one of the other assignments, right? What was the, the, the problem I gave you guys that was about the, the 1080p 30 frames per second stream? You want to know if you can watch this in real time on Google fiber. Okay. Um, and what did you guys figure out? The answer was no. Okay. But it was um, it was kind of deliberately broken question, okay? By which I mean, if you encode a single picture, and then you say, okay, I'm going to encode a movie as just a crap ton of those things, okay? That is going to take up way more data than you actually want to be able to transmit, okay? So, for example, with movies, like if you download a movie or video or something. What what format is it in? Any idea? MP4 usually, okay? Um, and that is both encoded but also compressed, okay? And it's compressed so that you're not actually transmitting every single frame in its entirety because that would take up way too much data. And why this works in movies, so imagine that you guys are watching me and I'm a movie. Okay, and then I start walking across the room. Okay, what's going to be true about the images each frame as I'm walking across the room? How much does each frame differ from the previous frame? A little bit, okay, but not the entire frame, okay, because you know, at each moment, I'm only going a little bit from the previous frame, okay? And so um, the encoding scheme, or the, the, the compression scheme, tries to take that into account. And so do I need to, for example, uh, encode the contents of the screen here, or what you guys see in that part of the room, every single frame if I'm just walking from here to there? You don't really need to do that, okay? Uh, similar with music, uh, it's compressed to save data. Yeah. Uh, that's different. I'll t talk about that in a minute, okay? Um, all right, so anyway, what have we done? Text encoding, that's the real, the, the big point for today. Uh, both ASCII and then the existence of Unicode. Now. The ASCII table, nobody in their right mind would ever memorize this, okay? And so, yes, you will always be able to have an ASCII table at your disposal because it would be ridiculous otherwise, okay? Um, all right, so we will start with something completely different on Wednesday. See you guys later.